fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. You're back in the House of Mystery on KFNX Phoenix 1100 AM. I'm Al Warren. Um, but first, let's introduce uh, Tom Colbert. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for inviting me. This is this is uh, quite a case. It's been with us for a long time. It happened in 1971. Between 68 and 72, uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember the exact figure, but there are close to 200 hijackings in the United States on American-owned uh, airliners. Uh, the, you know, people wanting to go to Cuba, wanted to see a boyfriend in Africa, heading to Europe. This was one of the first ones that involved for cash, a ransom. And that's what this man took advantage of. He actually um, gone on the plane and, and he registered as Dan Cooper, didn't he? Not D.B. So how, how was that changed? How did it become D.B. Cooper rather than Dan? Well, Dan Cooper is the name he put down and he actually wrote uh, his name down on the ticket, the uh, boarding pass. Uh, what happened is the FBI and local police, I'm not sure which, which was involved with what happened, but inside of it, I'm assuming a local law enforcement station in the Northwest after it occurred, uh, law enforcement is yelling out, well, where are we going next? And at the time, they were going down the phone books, literally looking for people named Cooper. Not many bad guys will use their real name, but back then it was, you know, it was the time of James Cagney, uh, you got me, copper. They assumed they could look him up, and they're starting yelling, and then somebody yells out, where are we going next? And they say, at D.B. Cooper. Well, there was a wire service reporter, and it's not sure AP or, or UPI, they've both have claimed it. One of them <laughs> uh, proudly put down what they thought they heard could be Cooper, and the rest is history. Everybody, as we talk about online, every. Back then, there was no online. It was word of mouth, and everybody just kept saying D.B. Cooper after that. How did you, yourself, get connected with this story? Uh, I become the senior researcher eventually in the newsroom, and I was the lucky guy that would get those strange calls, uh, <laughs> sometimes people walking up with stacks of court documents. But the phone calls with always the hard to hang up on were the Cooper calls, and they'd probably come in once a month. This was in the uh, in 80s. Uh, you know, it's my husband on his deathbed, it was an uncle, this and that, and as I said, it's hard to hang up on folks that are passionate about that. But, uh, you know, everybody had eye rolls. I'm sure you guys have had eye rolls on certain stories that seem to always come back. But but what happened here was um, my source was a 20-year cameraman I'd been working with since the 1980s, had called me in 2011, he lives in Vegas now. And he has a little network, he's very clever, he has a little network of sources within the casinos. And there was a gentleman who was about to become a grandpa who had something to get off his chest. And that word got around the, the casinos and he heard about it. And he sat him down after hearing a little. But my drug dealer, I was a drug runner, my drug dealer in Portland claimed to be D.B. Cooper. Now, oh, wow. I, well, my cameraman, when he's, I don't care that I know the cameraman, my eyes still naturally rolled, and oh gosh, a Cooper story. And he says, well, listen, listen. And so this guy in 79 claimed that he was a drug runner in the back of a British Bentley. The cocaine dealing wasn't even on the books yet as far as how to prosecute in Portland. And the cocaine dealers were running around in limos, and he's in the back seat, and his boss says, I'm Cooper. And for the year, he tries to convince him he's Cooper. He and his drug running partner. And at the end of the year, the drug dealer is having a cocaine party along the Columbia River. This is in February of 1980. And he pulls these guys aside and says, look, I know you guys don't believe me, but I'm going to prove it to you. And he points out the window at the north shore of the Columbia River. He says, you see the north side there? Then he turns to a couple of them in the crowd 
and he described them as a hippie-looking couple, and he says, that couple over there, the drug dealer said, they and their boy are going to find some of my money on that North Shore. Now, when I heard that, that's when I grabbed my steno pad, because bottom line is uh, I've been a part-time law enforcement trainer for 30 years, and one of the things we hear about the water cooler uh, among the men and blue, men and women in blue, was that that old story of the couple finding that fifty-eight hundred dollars on the river in 1980? The only evidence in the Cooper case, it, it's hogwash. They said it has to be. You know, it's, there's no way that couple could have done that. And we'll go into circumstances of the find, but bottom line was that made me jump because they said something had been phony on that river, and here is a possible explanation. And I took it from there. And I started interviewing this guy and got his tape. The videotape from the cameraman was sent out. And uh, for the next eight months, I did my diligence on this drug, drug dealer. First thing I found out, uh, about four or five months after that party, the drug dealer mysteriously dies in a one-car accident on a Portland isolated road. And that was fascinating. Yeah. And then I start tracking down his people that knew him, neighbors, grammar school, high school, frat brothers. And I'm not saying to them, hey, could your buddy have been Cooper? I don't want anybody yeah. to know what I'm working on. I'm saying, hey, could your buddy could have robbed a train? Could he have taken down a bank? And they're all going, nah, he was a party boy. He, he was a natural <laughs> guy. He was just a supplier. And uh, so I'm getting all these negatives. And then there's one more guy on the list I'm calling, and this is his frat brother. And the guy's name is Pudgy Hunt. He's a very well-known basketball player in high school, college. In fact, he had the uh, record for 50 years till Kevin Love in 2007 for having the most high school points scored in four years. And amazing guy. He even played adult basketball league. Well, now he owns several bars, and I'm calling this guy, and He's last on my list because, like you guys, I've seen too many movies where there's a bartender named Pudgy who whips out a sawed-off shotgun. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, bartenders, are always, bartenders are always on both sides of the law, let's face it, you know, uh, feeding an, uh, an addiction while looking the other way. Yeah. Um, so I call this guy, and sure enough, he's got a big gruffy voice. And uh, But the minute I mentioned Dick Briggs, that's the drug dealer, he just – becomes a puppy dog. He just, he loved that man. He talks about how he was great in school. And then I finally was honest with this guy after befriending him. I said, look, Pudgy, I got I to gotta tell you, you know, in the last year of his life, I found people that said he claimed to be Cooper. And Pudgy just gave a laugh like everyone else and said, no, he couldn't have been Cooper. In fact, I think he was sitting in my bar when that happened. And like, my shoulders are shrinking. <laughs> and, and thinking. Uh, and, he, and, he had an alibi. Well, yeah, he basically said he couldn't be. Everybody said he wasn't smart enough and didn't look it. He's short. He doesn't have the same face. So I realized my eight months is over. But then Pudgy, in the same breath, said, but, you know, I introduced him to a guy. He was a foreman on a floor job down in, in Malibu. Uh, he was putting in a floor at Pepperdine University in their gym. And, and Briggs was in L.A. looking for work, and I introduced him. That guy was a Vietnam vet. In fact... He was a D.B. Cooper suspect for a time, and I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. He just <laughs> found my partner. And that's when I realized and switched tracks and start looking into Rackstraw. Wow. And so how did you uh, assemble this team? Now, you've got – you assembled a team of, of people to um, help you, and it's as many as 40. Um, who, yeah. did you, who did you choose, and how did you put this together, and how did you get them on board? Well, bottom line is, is uh, my dad used to say, uh, my dad was, uh, I'm the son of a shrink, and, and my mom, who had seven kids, became a writer, a very successful writer. So my dad used to say, man, you got the, you definitely have the gift of verbal diarrhea, man. You never know when to stop. And he said, you should be a lawyer. And I said, no, no, no. I love writing. I love history, so I'm going to go into news. And I switched. Um, I tell you that because... I was recruited by the state of California as the senior researcher, Channel 2, because I could talk anybody into talking on the phone. My dad had taught me how to read between the lines, and a lot of you guys on the radio know that gift. Most of us have it. 
where you can really understand what they're saying, but they're not, and you have to bring it out. And that's, you know, we were all in an era in the 80s, and you may remember this, uh, that, you know, you're talking to people with their arms folded when you call the departments. Yeah. And my gift was to, um, I was recruited by the state of California to teach at uh, Camp San Luis, which is San Luis Obispo, halfway up the state, and that central state. And that was, uh, they brought me in uh, every month or two, flew me in to teach crisis management, uh, how to unfold those arms. And I taught hazardous material classes, hostage situations, disinformation, terrorism, and the main message was, and I, I always my I always love the opening of the class. I'd always say the same thing. I'd say, if you don't believe information, public information is as important in police for in fire protection, you need to leave. And I always had two or three leave, but it also told them that I was serious. And um, I gained thousands of students around the globe that I call friends. I can pick up the phone and open my old-fashioned Rolodexes <laughs> anytime to get into any department and have an understanding before the media does. So I have one foot in media from all my years in media, but I also have a foot in training. That's how we put together this cold case team. It's the biggest and most experienced, thousand years experience of skill sets and uh, experience, and, and in essence, uh, I can call anybody. And, and that's, uh, I'm not complimenting myself, I'm complimenting my, my law enforcement trainers and my teachers in the newsroom that taught, and my dad and mom on how to literally reach in and, and be honest. And that's the bottom line of a good radio host, and it's, a, it's the bottom line of a good researcher. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's curious also, there's so many people that have come out with, um, you know, theories, and they've done research, and they've, you know... Um, mm -hmm. Galen Cook and um, yes, Ross absolutely. Richardson, you know, they've all done really good work and they've all, and you know, yep. you've heard, and plus all the eye rolling, you know, for years and, mm -hmm. and all the stuff you hear. Um, mm -hmm. How did you, was it just a feeling you had that this was the right way to go when you were starting this? Meaning, did I know it was him? And yeah, felt like, 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 like what was like, because when you were first talking to Pudgy at, you know, you know, with the bar, mm -hmm. uh, was it just instinct that you thought, yeah, this this is this is the one? Well, look, I will tell you, um, it 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 has it, you have a sense when you talk to somebody that um, not only that they they're telling the truth, but they they're lying. And I'm reaching into people. Let's face it, everybody in the drug trade back then or now in their seventies and had their come to Jesus moment and having health problems and this and that and. And others are saying, you know, I can't, nobody can charge me after seven years with narcotics, so there's no big deal. And then I'm talking to people that knew this man. I'll tell you the one thing that was firm through all my phone calls was people that knew him directly. I had some people that hung up on me, said, he'll kill me. They literally said, I can't talk to you, they'll kill, he'll kill me. And I'm talking about a man oh, wow. with over 70 they're still scared of. And uh, that told me we had something serious going on here. Um, but I, you know, you mentioned Galen Cook. God bless Galen because he dug and found the four letters, the so-called D.D. Cooper letters that were all ma mailed within five days after the jump that were put away in files by the original agents. And even the current agents, they kind of roll their eyes when they hear about those letters. Well, guess what? Galen found letters that are linked, mailed to four newspapers, that I absolutely believe was mailed by our guy. And the reason I believe is we, you know, after hearing a coast-to-coast -coast broadcast with Galen, I went and got the transcript, and I'm reading where these letters were mailed from. I find out that the first and last letters were mailed within 50 miles, dropped in mailboxes, where he lived for the next year and a half in the foothills of the High Sierra, in a 1,500-person town, 500 miles from the Portland launch. Now, I had one of my first cold case guys, Jack Tremarco, one of the world's leading polygrapher. And by the way, he was used to interview and double-check that our drug runner who brought us this passed the, passed the polygraph, and he did. Well, he, when he heard the bit about the letters, he said, that's an 8 out of 10. Hmm. That's an 8 out of 10. This is a guy 
that they believe sent the letters, and you found out that he lived for a year and a half, 50 miles from the first and last letters, that's, it's, you know, Mm-hmm. There, there are some wonderful theories I'll be sharing with you as we move along, but uh, when we meet some of these characters in the stories. But what, remind me later of one that your audience will love. It's called the uh, whack-a-mole theory. And it comes from an uh, active investigator, an anonymous investigator who came up with it, and why he absolutely believes, and I believe, that this has to be Cooper. Hmm. And uh, those letters were pretty interesting yeah. too, right? From Vancouver and and Reno. Oh, Portland. absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, yeah, the four DB Cooper letters, and uh, you know, this man we've tracked to twenty-one different personalities, different aliases that he's used, and we believe his most famous one is when he was hiding up there after being kicked out of the military, which I know we'll talk about. He went up there and lived for four or five months. We have 15 witnesses in two towns that have identified him through photos and video, news video, and looked at him and said, that's that's the man that lived up here. And so, yeah, it just goes on. Yeah. It just goes on. What's the basic storyline for the people that don't know it? Let's, let's just cover that. So um, how it started and what he actually did on the plane and, and what he asked for. This is a man that we believe uh, was in his late 20s. Some people believe he could have been in his 30s and 40s, who came on in a business suit, as we said, just walk right into the plane. Nobody's checking you out. There's no major security. Sits down in the back seat and monitors as about 30-some-odd passengers come in, which is, I, I can't remember if it's half or a third of the capacity. And they're going on a short flight up to uh, Seattle from Portland. And the minute it takes off, the man with the briefcase, our suspect, opens uh, the briefcase and reveals what appears to be uh, dynamite uh, to one of the stewardesses. And in essence says, I want 200 grand or I'm going to blow this plane up. Well, the stewardesses and the crew made the point of not telling the passengers. They didn't want to panic them. And they just said, we have a little engine problem. We're not going to land quite yet. We'll deal with it, but uh, nothing to worry about. And so they circle for an hour or two while they gather the money and get four parachutes, which is what he requested. And when you think about that, that's brilliant. If you're requesting two front and back, obviously there's a chance the authorities might fix those not to open. But when you ask for four, you're worried he might be bringing a passenger or stewardess. So they couldn't monkey with him. It was brilliant. Can, can I ask also, too, didn't he ask for different types, or they give him different types of par- parachutes, didn't they? Well, he yes. When they were negotiating that, he wanted uh, military parachutes, but he didn't want uh, the standard ones that you, you've seen all the old movies where they hook them near the door and you jump and it pulls open the chute. He wanted to be able to have a standard uh, release uh, on the parachute like the newer ones, the sports parachutes. So he wanted a circuit. I don't know the official jargon here, folks, but the the, cir- the old military circle parachutes, but with a uh, a, a lever to pull, um, so that he could open it at his leisure. Uh, he didn't have much time to open it. He was not very high off the ground, um, but he is also halo trained, and that's high altitude, low opening. That means he went through special forces training to be able to be dropped from a 727 or an aircraft high up and come in like a commando and open it just before he hits the ground so no one sees him coming. Very few guys have that training, and our man apparently had halo training. Um, And he jumped, and the FBI has a pretty good idea where he jumped. Now, you, you've already, now, I'm getting a little bit excited here listening to the story because I'm already beginning to connect the dots. And I kind of wonder if this is how you felt when you did this. You have a suspect in mind that has prior military training, and that here he is on this plane, and he's asking for a military-style parachute. Now, what you're looking for is steerage lines. He he wanted a specific type of parachute that had steerage lines so that he could steer himself. Yeah, well, I'm not I'm how, not as sophisticated, I'm not sophisticated as you are in the description, but go ahead, go ahead. 
Oh, well, I'm just getting a little bit excited, but how did they manage to stay so calm when you've got a man who's got a briefcase full of dynamite? Is well, that what I'm understanding that he did? That's that's uh, uh, some of it. Um, I will tell you that uh, he was highly trained. Uh, this is a man that's off the scale genius. Um, we have. Uh, he went to Vietnam. He took every type of training he could as a National Guard member in California, then then a uh, Army Reserve, and then became regular Army when he became a chopper pilot, uh, and then headed to Vietnam. And he took more training. Um, he, he had over 50 medals, two uh, distinguished flying crosses, uh, silver, bronze. Uh, I mean, he's off the scales. He was an incredible pilot, but on the ground, he was trouble. Uh, as uh, your listeners, if they go to dbcooper.com, they can hear an incredible eight minutes by his only sibling, his, his sister, who we had the exclusive interview, and frankly, she surprised us just before to reveal she had uh, recurring cancer. But she insisted on giving this four-hour interview on why she believes he's Cooper. It's an amazing uh, eight minutes for your audience. Um, and we learned that this guy was a sociopath and a narcissist, but in Vietnam, on the ground, he was out of control. One of the people on our cold case team is his former Vietnam commander, wonderful man, who absolutely remembered this man's brilliance and capability, but on the ground he was, as I said, uh, really trouble. Um, first of all, he winds up stealing another commander's Jeep and driving it around for the time he's there, and he mounts a 50 cal for fun. And he takes that Jeep and he goes out two or three days at a time when he's on the ground with special forces and CIA. His former commander saw him leaving, a uh, fellow pilots, he just head out to the jungles. Well, why would they take him? He had explosives background, underwater explosives background, weapons training. He was off the scale, as I said. Uh, he took everything he could. And uh, that's what led to us deciding. This was the first. And, and by the way, the commander says he's abs he absolutely believes he's Cooper. Absolutely. He yes. said he had a hell-bent, go-to-hell attitude. He'd break the rules. He even jumped illegally. He would jump illegally with the South Vietnamese Army. Wow. I mean, so he, he was the perfect suspect. Uh, most of the suspects being looked at were special forces or paratroopers uh, in the first year or two. Well, the problem was our man, uh, flashing back to my dating days, was geographically undesirable. He was from California. And they were focused on the Northwest. Uh, one of those D.B. Cooper notes said, it's great to be back in P.O. Everybody thought that meant Portland, Oregon. Like Portland, Portland, Oregon. Yeah. That was, uh, I think, one of his disinformation points. He was highly trained in PSYOPs, uh, psychological operations. And he got that yeah. uh, American basis from the Special Forces. So... Do, do you think that he wrote these letters to kind of feed his narcissism? Like, look, look how great I am. You know, I'm taunting you. I'm writing you letters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would actually kind of fit in with this playoffs background. Absolutely. Um, I believe I sent you guys, Al, the uh, letter route, the letter map. And if you have that on your website for your audiences, that will show you the routes of these letters. I truly feel, first of all, let's step back a moment. When he was kicked out of the Army in June of 71, he left in a leased car. His wife divorced him uh, and left. Uh, it, it is documented that uh, he was beating his wife for seven years. Uh, she tried to divorce him at one point in 68. She, he apparently talked her out of it. And it was alcohol and beatings. And back then, sadly, uh, there was not as much control on the enlisted man when it came to beatings. Well, when he became a, he became a lieutenant through the war, he came back from Vietnam, and again, it started again. And his children, three children, one a baby, two little girls, toddlers, these toddlers finally knew what was right and wrong. And when Daddy came back, he was, they started screaming. And the MPs, and this is Fort Rucker, the commander eventually came in, and they find him choking his wife over the sink. 
And the military has a problem. Uh, the commander takes in the wife and, uh, and the children, and he and his wife hear about their seven years of hell. And back then, as I said, the military is not going to charge, you know, you don't have officers doing this. It's usually the enlisted man. And here's an enlisted man that was made a lieutenant, in fact, in charge of all uh, testing of new choppers coming in. He was given a big fancy title because of all of his medals. But it's the drinking and the beating that, that got him in trouble. And the military was sitting around saying, what do we do? We can't do that. Let's look into his background. And that's where they discovered this true, this true genius. He not only faked a college degree at USC and San Jose State, he was a high school dropout sophomore year. He was a genius who taught himself in the library, learning how to make homemade cannons, how to make human-sized gliders. I mean, he took a book on hand gliders and figured out the mathematics to make it something he could put levers on and fly off a building or fly off a mountaintop. And when his wife found that glider, I, I'm, forgive me, when his mom found that glider, she tied it down outside her kitchen window so he'd never take it. I mean, this this guy was off the scales. Yeah. And they realized yeah. we're going to have to kick him out on his fake college degrees and faking medals. He said he had the medals he didn't. Well, that's where we feel the motive is. We absolutely feel, after talking to family members and former military men and others, that the motive was, you think, hey, I, I'm a career man. You're going to let this little thing get in the way. I'm going to show you what your training did. And yeah. that's how we got in that lease car and headed northwest. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, and listening to, to his sister, that was um, about making the cannon when he was a young young boy. Oh, was, yeah. yeah. That was Even the glider, she talks about it. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty interesting. Now, you mentioned that um, uh, Robert Rackstar, he was also um, kind of a suspect uh, after, oh, yeah. you know, that of DB. So why was he a suspect, and why did they just not follow up on him? Well, first of all, he he told people under his alias up there that he was flying a plane for, he told his family, let me start that again, he told his family in California he was flying a small plane for realtors up there. And then he told people up there where he was under a fake identity, a European, uh, pretending to be a European walking America. He said he had a small plane. We absolutely believe he had a small plane. In fact, um, the FBI documented several folks in the jump zone that claimed in the storm they heard a small plane either taking off or flying low. I can tell you, two years later, Mr. Robert Rackstraw in the San Francisco Bay unlocks a secret hangar and shows his second coming wife a small Cessna that he claimed he owned. We double-checked, never registered. When we first realized that Briggs was wrong, and I started investigating uh, Mr. Rackstraw, um, I find out that he's an ulcer. There are a couple articles online you can find them that mention this man was arrested, he uh, was facing some uh, felonies in Central California, but he was cleared. I mean, that's in essence all there is online. And I found and looked at the main couple of papers up there. The most important one was the Stockton record. And I called this library, and a wonderful librarian who's mentioned in the book, because she's a hero, and so is an archivist up in, in nearby Calaveras County. These are the two ladies that really found the background that's been forgotten. Well, first, the Stockton gal. She, you know, there was, no, there was no microfish back in the 70s. There was nothing. There was no record of the 70s papers on his trial. But, you know, I, I truly feel God works a Ouija board sometimes. And I think he just happened to put somebody in the mode of putting a paper bag together full of clippings from all his trials. She found it in a back closet. And in every article, 51 articles, so I was able to put a pulse, a skin and bones on this man and see a 70s criminal that was off the scales. This guy was involved in check hiding, hiding 150 pounds of explosives, stealing a small plane. This guy, between trials and bail, didn't escape once by plane, three times by plane, and, as I'll explain later, once by river. And with his, you know, 21-state trail, five countries, 
and uh, 21 IDs, you realize you have a master outlaw. We call him a master outlaw, and it's a, it's a great word. If you look up the book Robin Hood, that was a synonym in the book. And in fact, there were master outlaws in the old London and in, in England that ran the forest. They even had crowns like kings. And they were called master outlaws. Well, it's a wonderful word for the West, obviously. This is just, he was on the cusp, just on the edge before CSI, DNA, surveillance cameras, crime databases, uh, all that wasn't around. He is truly the last Western outlaw. And that's the beauty of this story. And he's been living this way. But you know what? He didn't expect a thousand years experience from a cold case team with all the technology in the world would catch him. And that's where we are. Yeah, I noticed, um, uh, you know, you can explain, actually, the uh, when you confronted him, when you actually had uh, talked to him, yeah. that's on there. How, that, that isn't exactly the reaction of someone that would be innocent, <laughs> uh, you know, and plus he hid, in a, he hid in the garbage can or something, too, or what was that? Oh, thing? he, well, first of all, this guy has admitted to, we've counted at least a half a dozen incidents where he told people he was flat out Cooper, or I could be Cooper. He's on tape. He's on... He's on footage, uh, news footage. He gave an interview when he was in Stockton Jail. And this was when he was trying to switch from a a state sentence he expected for some of his felonies, trying to convince the FBI he might be Cooper, so please give me a club fed. You know, send me to a federal pen. Well, to do that, he had to convince them through media. So he calls down, I don't mean to digress here, but it's an important little thing, calls down to KNBC in Los Angeles, an NBC station, and literally calls the editor in the in the investigative unit and says, I'm D.B. Cooper. And the guy says, oh, yeah? Prove it. The man that said prove it is Pete Noyes, one of the most famous journalists on the West Coast. He's the guy that found Charlie Manson and told the LAPD where he was. He was also the guy that became Lou Grant on the TV shows. Um <laughs> But he never threw typewriters on TV. This guy really threw no typewriters. No way. He was angry. Yes, Ooh. yes. This I is know Lou Grant. That, this is the real Lou Grant that would throw typewriters. And I and I know some of the people in that newsroom, and they say, yeah, we used to duck. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, you know, they, you could be off your meds at that era. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, so that's, that's where uh, he called, and he said, prove it. And he said, well, I'm kind of in jail right now, but uh, I will tell you that uh, where I got the name Cooper. And he says, tell us. And he says, my Uncle Ed Cooper, Phoenix, jumped over 2,000 times as a teen. I saw him jump, and I fell in love with him, and that's where I got the name. Well, Pete Noyes assigns a rookie researcher, Vietnam vet, uh, to go find him. And he tracks him down a day later, and Ed Cooper says, yeah, that's my nephew. What is he up to now? And they told him about the Cooper thing. He says, I don't know anything about that, but, yeah, I'm related. Well, we're, we're glossing over this too quickly. I want to savor this for just a moment. You've got a man by the name of Cooper. He's a jump master, and now you said he's out west in Arizona, correct? He was in Phoenix. We found him, yep. In Phoenix, there's a famous jump school in Phoenix. And this was a criminal who jumped from a plane, has all this military experience. I mean, he's damn near a good candidate for the A-team, and I may be dating myself with that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) But uh, this is too perfect. But he's going to sit there and say, I don't know anything about that, but yes, this Good Lord, this could not have fell in any better way. Well, uh, let me tell you, uh, here's another example of the Ouija board. I, I'm, I'm calling, after I find out about Rackstraw, after I get this bag of clippings, I call the best guy for research uh, with government agencies. He happens to be that researcher that found Cooper. And I didn't know that. Don Ray, he was one of my mentors at CBS. He worked at all the stations. And I called up Don. He's retired. And I said, Don, I need somebody to dig out military uh, records on a guy uh, in St. Louis in the library. Can you help me out? I sure do it all the time. And what's his name? And he said, and I said, Robert Rackstraw. He goes, I know Robert Rackstraw. He called into our newsroom and, had, and said he was Cooper. And I'm looking up again. And I said, 
what, do I have to become a priest after this? What's, what, what's going on here, Lord? So that was the second miracle. And that's, that's how we got led to, to uh, you know, the videotape. Case, case, uh, KNBC, uh, Pete Noyes calls his favorite FBI agent in L.A., and this is a reflection. This is an important reflection for your audience to know. It shows the bias on this case. He called in and said, what about this guy up in Central Cal? He's called us and claims to be Cooper, and the FBI agent said, Pete, you're going down the wrong road again. I'm paraphrasing. You're going down the wrong road again. He's too young, and he's a con artist. You can't trust him. Again, think James Cagney law enforcement. You know, this is back in a time when you had a con artist and he said he wasn't Cooper. You just say, you just said it's not worth it. And, and this is the attitude Seattle had because L.A. and Seattle are the lead state, two of the lead FBI locations in the West. The rest of them are local FBI agents that, frankly, Washington, I've learned this, Washington doesn't trust the agents. They trust the guys in L.A. and they trust the guys in Seattle. And so when that was, statement was made, he's a con artist, you can't crush him, he's not Cooper Pete. Pete said, oh, yeah, I'm going anyway. <laughs> and Pete, I just went to, he just got a, a photo award. He's in his 80s. He's still alive. I went up, he went up with his camera crew. He did two interviews with Rackstraw. One when he was caught after uh, stealing a plane and one of his many escapes, interviewed him in March of 70. Uh, let's see, March 79, and then he interviewed on, on a sentencing in uh, July. And I'm turning to Don Ray after hearing he knows this guy, I said, is there video? And he says, that's a good question. We dug out the only footage of R.D.B. Cooper on tape saying, I might be Cooper. I might be Cooper. I mean, he plays with the reporters. And that footage, again, instrumental, we showed that footage to the witnesses up in Northern Cal, I'm sorry, in the Northwest, in Oregon, in Corvallis and Astoria. Now, it's one thing to give them an old black and white photo, but you've got moving pictures, the voice, the eye roll, the look down, how he ducks. You should hear these witnesses. It's stunning. It's, oh, my God, that's Norman. We had one woman who said, I'm an eye woman. I recognize eyes, and I'm looking at the eyes of the guy that befriended me at a party 45 years ago. I mean, it's stunning. And again, this is evidence, 102 pieces of evidence that the FBI doesn't want to look at. They actually closed their case on this. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they did that? I know absolutely why they did it. Um, when we found the drug runner tip, um, we spent, as I told you, eight months on the wrong guy, and then we started on the right guy, and then we approached the FBI because we have drug runners claiming that Rackstraw could possibly be involved in the planting of that money. So I threw my law enforcement front. You don't go through the front door on D.D. Cooper. No. You get it put in a stack of messages. I went through the back door. I called one of my old students who was uh, – uh, Rich Vigna, who is in charge, uh, he's the Pacific Coast Director of Customs uh, Operations Director in San Francisco. I said, would you mind reading a three or four page synopsis on a guy we got? He read it. He said, this is a really good argument for Cooper. He sends it to the FBI agent in charge. He had lunch with every week up in San Francisco. That woman forwards it to the agent in charge of the case in Seattle, and I'm in. Um, and in essence, uh, six months later, I finally get the meeting, and I walk in, and I bring a detective sergeant from Portland, one of my first cold case members, and we come in, and I say, look, I don't expect you guys to reopen the case on this guy, but we've got some former criminals here that say he was involved in planting the money, and if that's true, you let us know, and when you guys decide to do it, maybe we'll do the documentary. The FBI immediately said, well, um, we're not going to question the agents in 79 that cleared them, uh, but we encourage you, if you want to go ahead and do your doc, great. And if your viewers, uh, like America's Most Wanted, call in evidence, we'll consider it then. So I come home. Uh, I look at my wife, and, uh, you know, God bless my wife. Uh, I'm, you know, a little sidebar here. I married one of the heroes in my true story. <laughs> And we've been married now 24 years, and uh, she's in part of all my cases. 
and I come to, uh, come to Donna and I said, I call her DK. And I said, DK, uh, do we want to do another mystery on Cooper? Or do we want to put it together our own police department and solve it? And that's how it began. And we started creating the cold casing. Well, yeah, you're better off on your own. <laughs> you're better off on your own. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, this, you know, I, right. I, joke, I joked with some of these guys. I said, look, if the FBI does it, our priority is somewhere between Bigfoot and Jimmy Hoffa, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, I've, I've got to jump in here for just a moment because I'm thinking of all the facts that you came over. And this may sound like an off-the-wall question. I'm trying to put it all together like he would have. Why did he ask for four parachutes? It was brilliant. Um, he, this guy is so careful. And sophisticated. And remember, he had four or five months, we believe, living up there. Now, he was doing recon during the day, uh, uh, and at night he would be his character, his European uh, hiding. Uh, and so he was doing all the sophisticated stuff. He obviously thought very carefully about the flight. And by requesting four parachutes, you eliminate the factor that the authorities might dummy up the parachutes and make you crash. In other words, not open. If you order four, they don't know, is he taking a stewardess? Is he taking a passenger? We can't monkey with these. You see how brilliant that was? And this was deducted by people like Galen Cook and Bruce Smith, who runs the mountainnews.com, probably one of the best places for articles on the case over the years. And um, Bruce Smith noted this, that most experts – uh, believe his decision on his flight was brilliant. Now, there were other people saying, take me to Cuba or take me to Detroit and drop me. Well, of course, if you're in America, there are cop cars or FBI waiting for you when you give your location. This guy said, and because, again, he's an aviation expert, he said, I don't care. I'm going to Mexico. You decide which route you want to take. Well, Remember, he was specific. He said, I want the flaps at 15 degrees. I want the plane not going faster. I, I'm thinking, of, I think he said 200 miles an hour. I want it at a certain height. And otherwise, you can go any way you want. Well, he knew by watching the aircraft for months, there were two routes out of Seattle to go south. One's over the ocean, and one is down the I-5 freeway. It has a special flying pattern number. Those are the only two routes. Now, they weren't going to go over the ocean flying so slow and so low, it would have been dangerous if an engine went out. That left one route. So he knew exactly the route to jump through. And the FBI wasn't waiting for it because he didn't give it away. Mm. So, so he really planned this out. Oh, God, yeah. Cooper was brilliant. And, and, and when a, people say, well, why weren't his fingerprints on the plane? Because that's one of the things we heard. They couldn't find his fingerprints, and that, that they believe, is what cleared them along with the money being found on the river. And, oh, Cooper drowned, which is what the FBI announced on the river in 1980. Um, his, his prints weren't found on the plane. Well, it's important for your listeners to understand that that aircraft was at the end of a six-city stop. So there have been hundreds of prints on that plane, number one. Number two, the first people that get on the plane in Reno when it lands empty are the dogs. They're worried he could be hiding. So they send in these dogs with guys. There's no yellow tape up. There's no forensic gear on. They're just licking everything and going over and sniffing. There's the food that Cooper bought for the crew. They're eating the food. <laughs> they finally get the dogs out of there, and then the cleanup people are starting to come in. And finally, oh, we better keep these people out. Nope, nope, nope. And they bring in the guys. They didn't even fingerprint the magazines. I mean, it was real sloppy back then. Yeah. And uh, eventually, they took picked up, according to our FBI liaison that was involved uh, in the uh, program, uh, they admitted that they found 70 plastic cups. There was a cup in Cooper's seat. But another agent who wrote one of the authoritative books, and this agent doesn't have a suspect. He just did history. Um, he wrote a book. Uh, his name is Richard Tosaw, T-O-S-A-W. He went and talked to the agents involved in the pickup on the plane. 
And he was told that the only prints found on that cop were the stewardesses. And then you might say, okay, if he jumps out of the rear ramp, what about those ramps? According to the agent who talked to those involved, the ramps were smeared from top to bottom, not one print. So they were intentionally smeared? Intentionally smeared. That's what they believe, top to bottom. You now, where did he have time to do all of that? As, just as he stand, he was on the ramp for over five minutes, according to uh, the FBI transcripts. Oh, well, that's too say. <laughs> I would think that time on that ramp, my as well. I, I mean, remember, these special forces halo jumpers, they're taught to jump, fall into trees. They're fa taught to fall into rocks, into water. I mean, they're they're just off the scale. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. he's sitting up there, and he's memorizing. Now, remember, they're not only doing recon during the day of where to jump. He's figuring out where to jump at night. I'm sure he figured out certain houses that had bright lights. I figured out military bases in the distance, the lakes that had shimmering moonlight on them. This was an eight-mile-wide mm -hmm. strip between mountains that he absolutely knew that aircraft was going to travel through. And that's yeah. what he's going uh, to I, kinda, remember, right? I can kind of uh, relate a little bit to that because my brother was a jump master, and he was a halo and halo jumper. And, yeah, you can could, you could travel about 20 miles and then open your chute and then drop uh, perfectly. Uh, but wow, it's very, I mean, it's a very sophisticated training. Yeah, it's and and I will tell you just for correction purposes, you say a master jumper. Our man was not a master jumper. He was a jumper. He was a pilot. He was an explosives effort uh, expert. He didn't wait around for designations. His cap, his uh, uh, commander was a master jumper, and he knows he knows everything about jumping, and that's why he's so sure that this rebel. Was Cooper. Now, a part that I um, would like to talk about here is the planting of the money mm -hmm. and uh, being on uh, on the river. So, what was the point of of him planting that money? Well, this is a man that, uh, um, as I said, with all these identities he had in the seventies, and using identity when he's hiding before the jump, and then going uh, after the jump using. You know, he mailed seven letters under that identity, and the identity was Normandy Winter. What's fascinating about that name, Normandy Winter, claimed to be from Switzerland, claimed to be walking America. This was the 70s, guys. <laughs> he could walk America. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hanging with the people, so, so to speak, um, claiming to be a multimillionaire. Um, and by the way, we've substantiated all this. You, know, you, you can imagine the FBI when I bring 15 people like this to the table. It was like, well, how can you trust people in their 60s and 70s? Come on. I mean, do they remember where they were the day before? Of course not. Do they, uh, how many times have they lost their car keys? You could hear a defense attorney in the future courtroom. <laughs> well, here's the problem with that. Our 15th witness, uh, which was a she was a uh, she and her husband at the time were a hippie couple living up in Portland. And uh, she's watching the documentary and suddenly sees Rackstraw on camera, uh, KNBC, and she goes, oh, that's Norman. And what is she, well, this, the, God bless this woman. She, one of those great people that calls your station now and then that has the aisles of newspapers, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and that's this woman. And she starts searching her stacks. And she finds two articles that the historian paper says, we never covered Normandy winter. We don't know anything about that. Well, guess what? They were wrong. She found the two articles by a columnist. You'll love this. The columnist's last name is Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote stories about how Norman built thousands of dollars from the most affluent families in Astoria. And this substantiated all our witnesses. I mean, it's incredible. And I sent you that article. It should be up on your website. Uh, you not only see the article, what we revealed to the paper, they were wrong. I cut and pasted the old columns at the bottom. And the first, the things that our viewers and readers have been calling in is fascinating. This was one, because in the article it mentions that Normandy Winter was hanging around an electronics shop 
in Astoria, going in and out, and he asked the owner to order a very fancy two-way $700 radio, and that's pretty expensive back in 71. And he tells him it's for a friend of mine who's living in the wilds up in Canada, and I'm going to parachute it to him. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> My favorite is he, he uh, several people uh, told this writer that he claimed to have a, uh, a company in Switzerland where he lives, and it's an underground company, and they're creating a new form of energy that can fit into a briefcase. <laughs> now, one of my one of my sources said, "Holy cow, that sounds like Cooper with his briefcase." Yeah. Absolutely, wow. this is in the article. Yeah, and yeah. and so the FBI hasn't even seen those articles. That's why we're suing them to make them look. This is some of the evidence that we've gotten out of there. Pardon me for keep going on tangents, guys. But no, uh, it's, 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 it's so really that important. that's that's why we trust these people, and that's why we know this is the character and. And then he went to Corvallis after Astoria, and he mailed some letters back to the historians he stayed with. And when he was in Astoria, he was mailing letters back to a Corvallis football player from Astoria. I mean, he kept these letters going back and forth. And we know where he was the night before the jump. He was on a couch of a football player in Corvallis. Three witnesses, they held a party. They remembered the exact day of the party, a Thanksgiving party as we come up on the anniversary. And that's where he was the night before. What kind of history do we know on him, like in his earlier life? Wasn't he convicted of killing his father? Uh, Mr. Rackstraw was, according to his sister and later judges and co-workers, a absolute uh, con artist and a sociopath and narcissist. I mean, those are the words that keep popping up with people. Um, he was a guy that got away with everything. He was a good-looking kid. Uh, he Everybody loved him. I mean, one time he was drunk in a car as a teenager and hit his buddy's house. The parents didn't even tell his parents that they had to go under thousands of dollars repair for the house because Bob was driving a car. They, I mean, that's the way he would get away with things. One time he's pulled over uh, drunk uh, with a fake ID in town when he's, uh, I think he was 20, uh, and uh He's thrown in a jail cell, and he sets the mattress on fire. He claims, oh, it was an accident. But, uh, you know, the the agent, the uh, detectives and uh, sheriff deputies in this jail cell just say, go home, Bob. They let him out. <laughs> thank, thank God the newspaper still has the headline um, of, of his jail bust and setting it on fire. That became a little headline in the paper that we recovered. Uh, but this guy, because of his good looks, his charm, everyone says he has incredible charm, and I've experienced that personally. Um, he, he gets away with everything, and he got used to that, and he became a really good liar. As his sister explained, paraphrasing, she said that, uh, you know, Bob would shoot out all this information, and in the middle of it somewhere is a piece of truth. And you psychologically listen to somebody who's speaking a lot of words you listen for that moment, and you say, well, it must be true, because that I know is a fact. Well, that was the game Bob would play, and he did it with psyops, and he did it with con artist work, and he did it as Cooper, is that he would uh, uh, deny things, uh, but he put a little bit of truth in it. And his sister said, uh, in one of her final things in her interview, he said, it was, I, I just couldn't listen to him anymore. I had to break it off with him, because it was like, your fingernails on the chalkboard. I just, oh, here he goes again. And she never spoke to him, but really stopped talking to him after 1980 when he got clear and went out on parole and became himself. Um, she actually backed him up, and in, in, um, he was charged with, as I said, check hiding, uh, hoarding explosives without a license, stealing a small plane, writing uh, fraud, uh, fraudulent checks in his father's name. And yes, uh, when he was brought back from one of his escapes, they found his father's body buried three, um, uh, three feet down on his own property. And he was put on trial. When Mr. Rackstraw was brought back from that escape, he fled to Iran, of all places, the last year of the Shah in 1979. Hmm. 
he knew about the coming warrants for check hiding and so forth, so he fled. He went to Hawaii. He did some research, and he found out that there was an American company in Iran training the Shah's pilots to fly choppers. He became a pilot for the uh, helicopter company. And he was there for about a month until law enforcement caught up with him. And uh, there was a detective uh, who was hired by the family to find the dead and missing step, let's just say missing stepdad, and he eventually helped find the body. Uh, that detective uh, found some guy in a bar who was told by Mr. Rackstraw, I'm going to go to a chopper job I found in Iran. So that's how they got onto it. The detective told the FBI. The local cops told the FBI he looks like Cooper. Uh, he has the skill sets of Cooper. Um, so when they brought him back, the first thing they did when they got him into New York, JFK, is they said, are you D.B. Cooper? And he said, I want a lawyer. But he said, if you want to talk about the other things, which I deny, all these thing, dumb charges they have, I'll be happy to do that, but you bring up Cooper, I'm not going to say a thing. And so he he uh, he starts talking. Like like I told you, a little bits of truth and a lot of and, and the FBI is ready to get rid of this guy after three days. So the local sheriffs come in for the murder case, and they convince the FBI to release him, saying, "Look, we got a strong case. Uh, you can interview him in jail as long as you want once he's there, once he's in prison." So they send him off. Well, while he's in federal court in New York, transferring to local authority, he suddenly it collapses. Oh my back! They put him in a wheelchair. He is in that wheelchair through the murder case. In the murder case, he claims he doesn't have 40 uh, medals. He claims uh, 40, uh, 53, uh, another amount. And he says, I have five Purple Hearts. I have presidential citation. I'm a captain uh, in uh, Special Forces and, and, and uh, Green Beret. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, two bronze medals. He names a bunch of medals that aren't true. Well, back then, without the Internet, uh, to get those Pentagon records to check what he's saying, two months. The trial moved ahead with this hero in the wheelchair. And like the OJ trial, you know, this guy couldn't have done it. They let him off. Not guilty. He gets out on bail, and the FBI is going, another holy cow. Holy cow, what are we going to do? We were on our way to interview this guy. Well, he's out on bail. The night before he's off of bail and facing those other charges in a neighboring county, the FBI is coming in. That last day, he, does, he leaves a note at the airport. He tells his attorney, I'm going to go see my three kids with my divorced wife in Santa Cruz. And he heads that way from Stockton and uh, Calaveras County, and suddenly he's yelling Mayday off of Monterey Bay. Plane's on fire, smoke in the engine room, I'm going to go down. Well, he vanishes for another four months. They find nothing, of course, in the water. That's when they finally catch this guy after four months and bring him back, and he faces those other trials. So was he attempting to fake his own death, do you think? Yep. That's what he, uh, we, we tracked down, you should know the other heroes, if I haven't said it enough, the other heroes in this are not only the cold case team, are six of, the, six of his women that turned him in. Uh, on the back of the book, you'll be able to see that, that his sister, two ex-wives, have talked to us, um, uh, a getaway gal that, uh, that met up with him on two of his escapes, uh, a producer in Hollywood that was his cocaine partner, a woman, um, and a stewardess. These women all gave him up, and um, it was because of them that we were able to string these things together. So whereabouts is he now? Like, what's he doing now with his life? Well, when uh, he was in jail, uh, he got sentenced to two years for his um, check hiding and uh, stealing a plane and explosives. He only got two years. Um, but as I said just before, he escaped in the May Day. Now, this is key. Um, we have a witness up in Portland that saw him meeting with Dick Briggs just before those cocaine runners in the backseat of the limo heard their boss say, I'm Cooper. Now, this is important. The witness is Dick Briggs' own son. 
He's now in his 50s, Army career guy. God bless him fighting MS, but he's solid and smart. And when I tracked him down to talk about his dad, uh, it was obviously sensitive. He said, look, I love my dad, but I know what he was doing. And he was very cautious, but he agreed to provide information on detail. And after about a year and a half of trusting this man, I called him back and I said, I have a favor. I have an investigative report that the FBI guys on our team, former guys, are helping us prepare. I would really be honored if you would check your father's section to make sure the facts are right. So he goes to that section. I send him the investigative report. And suddenly he calls me right back. And and here comes another Ouija board moment. He says, oh, my God, I know this other guy. He says, who are you talking about? He says, this guy Rackstraw you have in here. This guy tried to kill me. So what are you talking about? He says, I was up in the window of my house, and we found a picture of his old house and that boy. He didn't call me back for a day when he saw his old dad's drug house. He said, I was in the upstores of that window, and I'm looking down, and my dad on the driveway is meeting a guy on a green motorcycle, long hair, beard. It's this guy. And I, I, in, in, the, in the thing I had sent him is the mud shot with the long beard. And we, predict, we figured it out on the length of the beard and the four months he was out. It was December of 78. And he had come to the driveway, and Dick Briggs is there with him. And the young kid, he's 13 years old, runs out because he loves motorcycles. He comes out to a look at this green Kawasaki. And that's when we believe Rackstraw said to him, you want to ride. He puts him on the back, and he proceeds to take the kid 90 miles an hour, wheelies, burning turns, the kid's screaming, he's pushing him off the back seat, he said, constantly, and he finally comes back cr- finally comes back crying and runs silently to his room, but he hears him tell his dad, I gave that guy quite a ride. We believe it's that meeting, that was the fourth, of five, fourth meeting of uh, four times he met Briggs, and remember, we also believe they exchanged money earlier, and that was the D.B. Cooper money, the other money they exchanged, and I'll explain that in a minute. But this time, we believe that's where the $5,800 was turned over, because less than two months later, Ron Carlson, the drug runner, and his partner were in the back of that limo, and suddenly, Dick Briggs is saying, I'm Cooper. And at the end of that year is when that money was found on the shore. Now, I know this is the big leap. This is the big thing. We don't have any other things except three drug runners. One's been checked on polygraph, and the hippie couple we interviewed, and they can't get their stories right. Happy to go into that. But this was the key moment, we believe, when the two men intersected. Uh, Rackstraw went back to California. He was caught. He faced uh, two years in jail at the end of one, uh, in the middle of the first year. Suddenly the money is found on the shore. Suddenly the FBI announces, well, we, we don't know this for a fact, but it appears Cooper has drowned. Robert Rackstraw is able to walk out of jail at the end of that first year. He doesn't have to serve the second. He hits the books. He gets three college degrees, including a law degree. He becomes an expert in arbitration. He becomes an instructor at UC Riverside, California. He becomes head of the law department for two of his ten years. <laughs> and now you can find him. Retired, running a little boat shop, a little boat shop in San Diego, uh, that he runs there, and that's where he, that's his life now. He's had three families, he's got uh, 14 grandkids, and four children by marriage, and two by high school. Whatever happened to the rest of the money? And I was about to bring that up uh, in wrong order, but I'll just tell you now. After the incident of sharing monies at Dick Briggs' house that were, we believe, used in the money plan, uh, it was 1974 they had their, uh, according to witnesses, their first money change. In 1974, um, Dick Briggs, a drug dealer, was just a local dealer. He wasn't a supplier. He was just uh, distributing among friends and neighbors uh, cocaine. Um, he was a roommate to a man named Jim Shell. Jim Shell was would become his middleman in the cocaine trade in the late 70s. But they were just college frat brothers. They lived together, both divorced dads, uh, near the Columbia River. 
um, Jim Shell comes home from work. He has a, a, a regular business job, comes home, and there is Dick Briggs on the dining room table doing coke lines with his new boss from a business in California laying floors, and the new boss is Robert Rackstraw. And Dick Briggs said, this guy had linebacker eyes that never stopped, looking around everywhere. I didn't like him. I could tell right away. And then I looked down below him, and there's this big gunny sack of money. It didn't involve me, so I went in the other room, and I'm going, Jim, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not ending the story. What the hell was that about? He said, uh, well, look, it's not my business, but he had a huge gunny sack of money. And I'm thinking, 1974, two and a half years after the jump, a Californian we think was Cooper is bringing a gunny sack to a cocaine dealer. And my next quick question was, i got to ask you, did Dick Briggs deal with Krugerrands? Krugerrands was the illegal... Uh, tender of the drug trade back then. It was the time of the yeah, apartheid. Gold. Yeah, he had gold. And, he, and we asked him, did Dick Briggs deal with the cougar ants? And he goes, oh yeah, he wore a couple of them around his neck. Well, in the next few months of research, I find two witnesses. One, he pays off a $60,000 bail that he jumped with cougar ants. And another gal, his getaway gal, said, yeah, I saw his cougar ants. That's where we believe the money went. He somehow bought, and again, speculating here, Dick Briggs' connections to cocaine in Colombia. I have a feeling that money was exchanged. I'm sure it was the usual look. I'll give you uh, nine. It was two hundred thousand, so some of it was found on the. I'll give you one hundred eighty thousand, but and you give me back one hundred sixty thousand in unmarked coins and change and whatever. And so we believe that's where the money went south. They were not looking for the. Um, serial numbers in South America or Europe. It was only the North America. And back then, American dollars from the Philippines to Africa were being used by the poor countries as their money. It was trusted. And so it never came back, we believe. Wow. That's, that's just great. The, the research you've done is just incredible on this. Um, well, it's all my team. It's yeah, all my yeah, team. That's, just, you, here. yeah, the whole group of you. And uh, uh, that's amazing. Um, now, uh, one last thing. I know on the, um, have, have you seen that, uh, there's the other documentary of National Geographic. Mm -hmm. um, where which they, one is that? Well, they were, where they talked to that couple's son that found the money. Yes, yes. This is an older, correct, several years ago? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a few years back. It's in, it's in the 2010 right, right. area, I think. Are we talking yeah, about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Cooper, the money that was found in the river couple? He, yeah, that's right, the couple. And they, ha they had the uh, uh, son of that couple on there. Right, who I've interviewed, too. Yeah. Yes, because I, I, have to, I have to kind of sit here ashamed, and I thought that was research that I was doing. When I heard we were going to be talking to you, I'm going to do my research. So I've watched that special. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will tell you. I will tell you that um, you know. I, I obviously the eight-year-old boy is not involved in it with a scheme. Right. Uh, the, the first example of the problem with his parents' story, and it was mostly his dad doing the talking, was uh, you know, dad is telling me I tracked down the parents when they were still together. They're now divorced. I tracked them down in 2011, and I I got the parents on. Uh, phone lines that they shared in a house, uh, his son's house. They didn't even have phones in their house. Um, and so it took a week to get them over to their son's house in the neighborhood, and they got on the phone, and I was calling them and saying, look, this could be, and it's true, we, we're planning a limited series or movie when this is all done. I told them, look, this could be a movie. What you guys went through that week, uh, you kind of were like Howard Hughes when he picked up a <laughs> straggler. And that became a movie. You guys sort of got thrown in the middle of this whole thing. Yep, yep. Well, I'd love to talk to your parents, Brian. Could you arrange for them to get on the phone? And so sure enough, uh, it took a week, and Mom and Dad are in different phones in the same house, not looking at each other, which was important. And the minute they got on the phone, they think they're talking to a Hollywood producer about making their one week a movie. And I say, look, i got to be honest with you. I'm calling you about uh, three separate witnesses that claim you guys were at a party planning to plant that money. Dead silence. And I want you to know, though, the man that set that up, 
the man that arranged that is dead now, Dick Briggs, so you have nothing to worry about. And that's when Dad goes, uh huh. I don't know this guy. Why would I say, uh huh? And I said, uh, so what? Do you guys have something to tell me? Well, well, we didn't. We never went to parties. We were we were raising children. We were never there. We wouldn't have done that. So this is plausible deniability, fine, but it made my radar go right up. Now flash ahead to December of 2011. I'm at the 40th symposium of D.B. Cooper. This is arranged by the most recent author, uh, Jeff Gray, who did the Skyjack book, which is pretty decent. It's about three of the suspects over the years. And he's selling the books while he's having the symposium. It's the first time all these Cooper rights from around the country are together. They're meeting the former FBI agents, the parachute designers. Everybody are there. Everybody's there. I'm there for one big reason. Does anybody ever heard of Rackstraw? And the answer, no. He was never mentioned at the event. Again, out of sight, out of mind in California. Deniability. We've done all the parachute guys. We've done all the paratroopers, the special for This guy down there, he's a liar, a con artist. He can't be trusted. That's what I felt when I got there. And who walks in but Brian? He's 40 years old. He has his new baby, his new wife, his third wife. And uh, I congratulate them on the baby. And, I, and Now, remember, he set up that phone call with his parents. And his parents have since talked to him about how I confronted them. And I said, look, Brian, I, I'm sorry about what I had to do. Oh, yeah, what was that all about? I said, look, I had these three guys that have been hounding me for years. I had to spin out the theory. It's all good, all good. Would you talk to me? Sure, sure. So he sits down on camera. And that's where I confronted him with it. I told him what his dad had really said. Dad never told him. I said, Dad said, you know, that uh, the minute he found the money, he ran to a phone booth, he called the FBI and left a message, hey, I've got some serial numbers. I know it's Cooper's money. I'm going to read it to you. Well, that's what his dad told me. And Brian's going, I, I never heard that story. It's also a problem because when you read the Seattle newspaper, uh, the day after, two days after the news conference, Dad and Brian are talking. And Brian says, my parents didn't know whose money it was and thought it was phony. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dad's saying, that's true, that's true, and that's in print. Well, here he is telling me on the phone, no, no, I ran to a phone booth, I knew it was Cooper, and I called in the serial numbers. So total problems, and that leads up finally to when History Channel, we are reapproached them, sat them down had them watch Dick, uh, Ron Carlson, the drug runner's accusations that they were at the party planning it with Briggs. And our FBI liaison, hired by History Channel, to look at our three days of evidence, watches uh, the father who had found the money, watching the drug runner on a laptop, Jim Forbes, the reporter, holding it, showing it to him, and suddenly the FBI guy in the room I'm in being recorded for History Channel is smiling. And at the end, Jim Forbes says, why are you smiling? He says, this guy is showing the classic signs of lying. He's wringing his hands. He's rubbing his face. He's rolling his eyes. He's turning away. He said, those are all signs. That was cut from the documentary. You didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. But that's exactly what happened. And... Um, my favorite moment, though, was when on tape he, he said, well, tell us how you planted it for you. I mean, how this happened. And he said, well, my son runs up. Hey, let's cook some dogs. And that's true. They were cooking hot dogs on a winter morning on the beach. And uh, he said, uh, I want to build a fire. And he says, well, all right, you go right over there. And he says, see those two sticks in the sand? Dig right there. <laughs> <laughs> And a 65-year-old is saying this, and I'm thinking, and then his son, who's sitting next to him for this interview, suddenly turns to him, not only during the lying part, but during this whole thing, he's quiet. Again, he was eight years old. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry to go, that's the whole story of the money. That's yeah. why I think it was planted. Yeah, yeah. It was just also in Skyjack <laughs> with, with Jeff Gray. That's what um, his claim is that, uh, you know, uh, um, it it was from, you know, a, a a liner or a boat that came up the river and dragged the money up. That was one of the uh, the propeller theory it was yeah, called. Yeah, that's right. And, <laughs> I kinda... and the 
and the FBI agent in charge at the time, a lot of people said that's the thing that got him booted from the position of the, of the Cooper case. Uh, but look, if it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for Larry Carr, that's the agent. He used to be a bank robber age, agent out of Minnesota. And he wanted to take over the case in 07, and they let him. Nobody wanted it. And he's the one that opened it up, the details, to the Cooperites, the so-called researchers out there. And he uh, shared with a couple of them the transcriptions of the interviews along the river. He he allowed them to look at the evidence of the ticket that was signed. If it wasn't for Carr, I wouldn't know that that ticket was signed by our guy. And I'll tell you quickly, the second D.B. Cooper letter, the other three were cut and pasted like the Zodiac Killer. Right. Ha ha, you can't find me, blah, blah, blah. The second one, he went up to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And he's there. And he writes a letter, hand writes it, because he noticed the paper Monday morning. The Monday morning paper, four days after, is showing that Bing Crosby-looking sketch. That's the wrong sketch. That's the one that stewardesses couldn't agree on what he looked like. And again, remember, they are victims of trauma. Oh, he had big ears, he had little ears, he had this, he had that. That picture, nobody... Well, Rackstraw, we believe, or Cooper... His ego was hurt, and he wrote that letter, and he's saying, you know, just like I suspected, the FBI, paraphrasing, is, is that's not what I look like at all. I'm watching the Grey Cup game here, the Super Bowl of Canada football. Thanks for, thanks for the hospitality. Signed, E.B. Cooper. Well, he is the thanks to the hospitality. That's how Cooper signed the first letter to Reno. Now, before you say, oh, we heard it in the news and copied it, uh-uh. That first letter wasn't printed till Monday. He mailed his letter to the Vancouver paper at 2 p.m. Monday. Um, and so there's no way they crossed in the mail. Mm. But here's the key, the handwriting. My wife and I are looking at the handwriting of the letter. And then I pull out the released by Larry Carr, the actual uh, boarding pass. And you have these, I think I sent to you for your website and your viewers or your listeners. Uh, you have this for your website and your listeners. Um, you look at the letters and you say, oh, my gosh, these nine letters of the name are matched in the letter sent from Vancouver. Now, that's when I brought in the most respected document forensic expert. And there's an association that has the word courtroom in it for these guys. Those are the only legitimate people because they have to testify. This is a, a guy from, uh, from the Caribbean who testifies in courts from England to Canada to America. He's done over 100 American cases. I track him down in San Francisco and send him these documents, the handwritten letter and the boarding pass. And he says there are similarities and it appears to be written by one man. Well, that puts our guy, we believe, because remember, that third letter, the FBI believes they're all from the same people, that the first and last letter came from Rackstraw's house in California. This puts our man on the boarding line. I mean, 102 pieces of evidence, what do you need, you know? It's, it's, uh, we, have a, we have a former two-time U.S. attorney. We have two on our team. A former two, and by the way, your, your your listeners can look at our cold case team. We have them up on the website, dbcooper.com. Uh, it says, meet the cold case team. On the left side, we have a button called uh, court evidence. They can look at the 102 pieces of evidence in our criminal case. This is what has truly embarrassed the FBI who are trying to avoid this case. They're very afraid of a circumstantial case after 45 years, and you and I can understand that. They're thinking that the evidence would be corrupted, the witnesses won't stand up. Well, let me tell you, i got great witnesses. I've got great uh, evidence. We even have 12 of his family members working with us. I mean, you can't have better information, but they are fearful. And this is what was said by our liaison, again, not in the documentary cut out. He said they're concerned, my guys say it's fearful, concerned that a circumstantial case can't be won. And remember, half the country think this guy is a folk hero. All it takes is one of the jury members to believe that, and the case loses. 
That's their greatest fear. But you know what? That's not my job. That's not your job. That's the DOJ's job to make a decision. The FBI preceded all that by just saying we won't look at it. So do you think it'll ever get to that point where uh, it'll be taken to court, or do you think it'll just... Well, I don't really think the FBI is going to change stripes. Now, we do have a change of government coming here and a new president who is very TV savvy. <laughs> <laughs> And he just might want to get in the middle of this, but that's my argument. That's why I got a call from the historian paper, and we have another paper who are doing anniversary stories this this week, uh, because the court case is Monday. It starts involving our 12 agents, FBI guys. This would be pretty embarrassing for Comey, who has been written about this week, that Trump's really not too hot on Comey right now. And this is not going to help if it comes out 12 agents are accusing of him hiding and and politicizing a case and refusing to look at evidence and so forth. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what they're facing right now. And um, I don't know. I don't think the FBI is going to change their stripes. I will tell you, I have a producer partner who's done movies with me in the past. By the way, this is my 21st uh, movie or documentary for the bigger small screen. And um, we're thrilled about it. Uh, but there may be something else here. If the, we've decided if the FBI chooses not to tackle this case, uh, a producer partner and I are developing a program called The Trial of D.B. Cooper. It's going to be a scripted program with probably a real TV judge and some real former prosecutors and our cold case team testifying the evidence in front of an actor playing Mr. Robert Rackstraw. The jury is the best jury in the land. We're planning it to be social media. We're going to let the American public vote. Is Mr. Rackstraw Cooper or not? Hmm. That'll be interesting. That'll be fantastic. Stay tuned, as they say. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I should wrap this up. Um, so how do people, if someone wants to get a hold of you or if there's somebody else has some information or something that they want to pass on to you, how would you like them to do that? Oh, they're doing it. They can do that through dbcooper.com. I have a, a link there to email me. Um, and uh, I, I will tell you one other thing that came in. I talked to you about the letters that the 15th witness up north found. We had a wonderful Army veteran of Rackstraw's era who watched the, the documentary and said, you know, every time I heard the name Normandy Winter, it was like somebody hit me against the head. He said, look... Rackstraw went to the same Army Airborne School that I did. One of the co-founders was Dick Winters, his nickname, World War II hero, Normandy Winters. <laughs> he said, I absolutely believe your guy, who took his uncle name, Cooper, took his former guy. They repeat the story of Normandy Winters at that camp today. Uh, it's like Cadence. And I, and he says, I absolutely believe that's where he got his name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah, it just, <laughs> yeah, it just all, it just all comes together. It just falls together, and it's, it just seems to be way too easy. You know what I mean? Like it just, yeah, that's just. Uh, well, it wasn't. No, I mean, I mean the way it, the way it comes together, uh, not the. Oh, way I know. It, the, it's it, it. There is such a web, and, and and I will tell you my final bit of information, which is my favorite theory, by my southern uh, South Carolina uh, senior investigator, who has been so helpful. He did the evidence list. He looked at our list and found 102 pieces of evidence and everything we found. But he said to me, "Let me get this straight." He said, "You're telling me." that there are three master criminals, master cons, all within 100 miles of each other in the Northwest. you got Rackstraw, who's a, who's a designated con artist kicked out of the military, who's a lifelong criminal, heading to the Northwest, he tells his family. Then, as he's heading to North there, the family is not in touch with him for months. Suddenly, Normandy Winter appears, who's a master criminal, dealing thousands who has a plane, who's living up there. And then you have a third guy, D.B. Cooper. When Normandy Winter vanishes, Cooper appears. So let me get this clear. You've got three master criminals who witnesses say all look alike, and they come and go like whack-a-mole. He said, impossible. 
Master criminals like this, he says, comes once every two to three years in America. And I verified that stat with some judges on the West Coast. They said, yeah, we don't see guys like this for every one or two years. So everybody was told by this guy, he said, you cannot have three master criminals within 100 miles of each other coming and going like whack-a-mole. Isn't that a great theory? Yeah. <laughs> Totally aced it for me. I said, when I heard that, I said, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. This is him. Yeah, you just know when it's when it's right. Well, uh, again, this has been great. And, uh, of course, all the links are Thank you guys for your patience uh, for a guy who goes on tangents for a living. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, just, I, I just love hearing the information, and I'm sure everybody else will. And, um, again, the book, uh, Last Master Outlaw, and the link of dbcooper.com. Uh, we'll all be up Thank you so website. much for mentioning. Yeah. I want to do quickly mention that um, what's fascinating about this book is half the readers are women. And I truly feel it's because there's six women heroes involved here that turned them in. And, you know, we're up, we have over 50, what is it, 52 out of 56 reader uh, evaluations are five stars. And not one says we got the wrong guy. So I'm absolutely thrilled for my co-writer. Tom Solacy, and of course the cold case team, they deserve the credit here. They really, really do. Well, again, thank you very much, Tom Colbert. Great meeting you both. Thank you. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll say it! This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. <laughs>